Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, director Ken Loach portrays an ordinary man against an uncaring system in I, Daniel Blake. Daniel Blake, played by Dave Johns, is a 59-year-old carpenter in Newcastle who is recovering from a recent heart attack, but his benefits are revoked because he fails to gain enough points in his medical assessment to be entitled to them. Despite his doctor saying he's not fit for work yet, he's forced to try and claim job seekers' allowance before he runs out of money, spending his time applying for jobs he can't accept to try and qualify, which brings new hassles and obstacles. Along the way, Daniel befriends single mother Katie, played by Hayley Squires, who is struggling to provide for her family, and he tries to help her however he can. Ken Loach is one of Britain's defying filmmakers, and his career spans across five decades, all the way back to the seminal 1960s television drama, Kathy Come Home, which dealt with the issue of homelessness in a very realistic, almost documentary-like fashion that really brought it home into people's living rooms and thoroughly shocked them. And ever since then, Loach has often dealt with difficult, sometimes controversial subject matter in a very uncompromising way. And while a lot of his contemporaries went to America, Loach stayed put and made stories about the working class, and his own political affiliations are very much left-wing. And Loach's style of filmmaking very much strives for a sense of realism, almost documentary-like. I mentioned Kathy Come Home because it's basically the blueprint for a Ken Loach movie, in that he very much relies upon improvisation. He'll, he'll seldom give the actors involved a full, complete version of the script. He'll give them fragments as they go along, so the actors go on the journeys of the characters as they as they shoot the film in chronological order. It's a very unique way of filmmaking that defines Loach's commitment to trying to capture the authenticity of what he's trying to put across. He is very much engaged with the issues that he's trying to raise in his films. Across his long and storied career, there have been a number of movies that have been especially celebrated, like Cares or The Wind That Shakes the Barley, but in recent years, there was some debate over whether or not Loach would retire. His most recent film before this one, Jimmy's Hall, was met with a somewhat lukewarm response. But it appears that the, the re-election of the Conservative Tory government has, has seemingly fired up something within Loach again because he's back with I, Daniel Blake, which is perhaps one of his best films in recent years. It, in fact, won the Palm d'Or at the 2016 Cannes Film Festival. If you're interested in Loach's movies, I highly recommend checking out the documentary Versus, The Life and Films of Ken Loach, which was also released this year and I'd watch for this review, although I would be careful to not watch it before seeing this film, because while it is pertinent to this discussion, because the film shows the sort of behind the scenes look at how I, Daniel Blake is made, it also contains significant spoilers. In I, Daniel Blake, Loach has the benefits and welfare system firmly set in his sides. There's a famous line in Kathy Come Home where she screams, you don't care, you only pretend to care. And that line could also apply to the events of this film. It appears that in 50 years, not much has really changed. Although that makes sense, given that many of Loach's films are just a cry for simple, basic human compassion. And in this case, the system is characterised as being incredibly inhumane, particularly the job centre employees that are characterised as being officious and not actually listening to the people that they have in their care, not giving them the help they really need. There are exceptions, of course. There's one particular job centre employee in this movie that does try and help Daniel across his journey, but unfortunately she's the exception rather than the norm, and in some cases she actually gets chewed out by her boss for doing so. It's a system that's characterised by, by both its bureaucracy and its negligence, and those two often intertwine in a way that's almost Kafka-esque, in just how ridiculous it almost seems, except when you consider the fact that this film has been 
very extensively researched by both Loach and writer Paul Laverty that Loach has worked with for 20 years now, for many people this isn't a work of fiction. This is how their ordinary lives are, having to struggle against this system for just what they're entitled to. I think Loach's movies tend to get mischaracterized as being completely dreary, humor-free kitchen sink dramas, but that's not really the case. I, Daniel Blake, does have moments of levity in it. And I think Larity realises that this is in some ways a farce, so there are some comedic elements here. You can see that right at the very top of the movie, where the fateful medical assessment that Daniel has is played out mostly in audio over the opening credits, which both accentuates how impersonal it is and how completely ridiculous the line of questioning is that Daniel repeatedly points out, and there are a couple of laughs in that particular moment. When Daniel discovers that he's not eligible for its benefits, he receives it via a letter in the post, and when he rings up onto the onto the onto the customer service line and and having spent an hour and a half waiting for it in a situation that anyone has that has had to wait for a call center knows exactly what that's like and no and can empathize with Daniel at that particular moment he's then told that he shouldn't have received the letter first he should have received a phone call telling him that his benefits have been revoked and then received the letter in the post and there's a, and then later in the movie it becomes a almost like a ticking clock of when that call is actually going to arrive it makes a firm point about just how incompetent the system is in some respects. And what's really good storytelling is that it starts out on a humorous, almost inconvenient note, but as it progresses, it becomes more and more serious. Those moments of levity begin to dry up as Daniel's situation becomes more and more severe. And some things that we may have previously found humorous take a much darker turn. Case in point, the sanctions for Daniel failing the criteria for his job seeker's allowance. When it's brought up, it's almost in a way that you would find humorous because it sounds impotent. Oh, I'll get a sanction. But later on, we discover what the actual consequences are of those sanctions, the penalties of them, can be truly debilitating and really can exacerbate Daniel's situation. They could legitimately mean the difference between life and death. And the whole situation of Daniel trying to fill that criteria is infuriating, both to him and to us. He is looking around for jobs that he knows that he can't accept because his doctors have told him that he's not ready to go back to work yet because he's recovering from his heart attack. He's wasting employers' time. He knows that he's wasting employers' time, but he has to do it in order to fill the criteria. And if they offer him the jobs, so he gets the added humiliation of having to of having to get shouted at by by people whose time that he has wasted and it's just this rigmarole that grinds him down. What really makes it so powerful is that Daniel Blake could be anyone. He could be that person sat across from you on the bus, he could be someone you know, he could even be you. It could happen to anybody. Dave Johns is fantastic. He was selected by Loach as part of a careful process. It's clear that he was selected for his abilities in improvisation. Johns is making his film debut here, which makes it even more incredible because his 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 actual job is as a comedian. He's well known on the London stand-up circuit, but you wouldn't think it from his performance here. He does a remarkable job of appearing ordinary, as appearing as the everyman. And in some respects, I, Daniel Blake, is a portrait of a man. You know, an older gentleman has been a little bit left behind by the world in some respects. His wife has died. But at the centre of it, he's a good man. He's, he's a good, honest man man. He does his bit, he helps people, and he tries to fight with all his might against the indignity that he's having to be put through. And John's performance is powerful, and it, and it always rings true. 
every single bit of it is completely convincing. But just as brilliant, if not even more so, is Hayley Squires as Katie, who is another character that Daniel meets along the way after she has a row with a job centre employee and he takes her under his wing. He almost becomes like a surrogate father figure. She is this single mother of two children that has recently moved up north because she has been waiting for years in a shelter for housing to be made available to her and they've only found one up north and her her family has already been disoriented by the fact that they've spent years having to live in this single room together and now that they've been strained even further because her family is based in London and she's been cut off from them essentially so she she almost has no support network aside from Daniel and Squires' performance is heartbreaking it's it's so emotional and moving. She, She's essentially trying to do the best for her children. That's all she's trying to do throughout the entire movie. Everything is about the, putting them first. What little she, she has is about feeding them, about clothing them, and just taking care of them. And she becomes a very distant second. And that really takes its toll on her. You can tell that she's that she is desperate, that she's really at the end of her tether. There's a, there's a key scene in her food bank where she completely breaks down and it's one of the most devastating scenes of the year. It is a fantastically acted scene and it's... It, you'd have to have a stone heart not to get a little bit emotional about it yourself. It really underlines the character's pure struggle and she's just trying to do what's best for everyone and yet she doesn't have the means to really accomplish that. And the relationship that Squires and Johns have across the movie is so beautifully natural. It's a really wonderful bit of chemistry between them and that relationship between the two characters again adds some levity to the movie. I think what Loach and, Le and Laverty understand is that life is not all hardship. It, Yes, you can go through tough times, but even in those moments, you can still have little pieces of humour and warmth. And it's that kind of humanity that makes it feel so authentic, that makes it so real and so genuine. As great as this film is, there are some little things that did bother me. The first is of the representation of technology. Daniel is an older man who's not really familiar with the computer age. He doesn't know how to operate one. And that I don't find unrealistic. That is actually very accurate. There are a lot of people of his generation that are simply not computer literate. And that is a very realistic hurdle for Daniel to face. He he wants a paper form of this questionnaire, but they don't do it anymore. He has to fill that out online. And it becomes this arduous ordeal to try and operate a computer that he has no familiarity with whatsoever. My problem with this is that it did feel like it was a little bit overly exaggerated. It didn't feel entirely realistic in its approach. It's especially because you can very clearly see Johns as Daniel moving past an obvious questionnaire piece so that he can get the error message. And they keep doing that time and time again. I found that distracting. It was obviously engineering itself to try and come up with that scenario as opposed to other things that happened in that sequence like Daniel getting timed out of his session and things like that. That felt realistic, but mainly my problem with this particular element of the movie is that we've established that Daniel has a much younger next door neighbour and he ultimately fills in that questionnaire with that neighbour's assistance. And yet for some reason, across the rest of the movie, he never thinks to use him again. He never asks for his help again, which feels like a weird plot hole, especially because there is a pivotal plot point about the fact that his CV, it needs to be typed up, and yet he decides to handwrite it instead, which is a big no-no. And yet, he, we have this neighbour who is established as wanting to help Daniel if he needs it, and yet he doesn't take it. That I found a little bit puzzling. And I did feel slightly conflicted about the film's ending because the final scene is fantastic and it's a savage indictment of everything that we've seen beforehand and also a reaffirmation of Daniel's humanity. 
but the developments in the plot leading up to that are maybe a little bit too obvious. The hand is, you know, a little bit too predictable in where it's trying to end up. But honestly, I don't think Loach really cares because there's a point that he wants to make. There's a point he wants you to feel and hear and remember. And that is the purpose of the movie's final scene. I think it accomplishes those aims. Honestly, I have to say that these are fairly minor gripes, to be honest, because I would wholeheartedly recommend I, Daniel Blake. It's not exactly easy viewing, but it is a great movie. It's one of Loach's best films in a long time. And it's not just a brilliant film, it's also an important one as well. I, Daniel Blake, is a moving and affecting portrayal of how people are disregarded by a system that only sees them as statistics rather than human beings. It's Ken Loach's best and most powerful film in years, addressing a timely and provocative subject matter that is sadly all too real for many, with Johns and Squires giving authentic and natural performances that will stay with you. Loach and Laverty have created a film that's rich in human emotion, managing to find moments of hope and joy and not simply misery that gets a real sense of the characters and the world it represents. Ends. Even though the message is delivered with a heavy hand, especially in the film's conclusion, it doesn't negate its power or that it's one worth listening to and remembering. If you like this review and would like to see more of them, please support my work over at Patreon at www.patreon.com filmbrain, where even the smallest pledge can be a big help. Until next time, I'm Matthew Burke, fading out.